Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 511, uh, with me, Dr. Matt Barton, featuring an interview with Mr. Dominic Armato. Now, if you're not familiar with the name, you're probably familiar with the voice. Uh, he plays uh, Guybrush Threepwood in the legendary Monkey Island series. And by the way, if you haven't played that series or any of those games, stop the video. Go play those games. You can thank me later. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Dominic was gracious enough to sit down with me. Uh, we talked a lot about Monkey Island, what it's like to be a voice actor, and uh, also, oddly enough, food. Because Dominic is also, or he's now, I guess, a professional food critic. Uh, so we found a lot of interesting intersections between uh, his voice acting and the world of games, the games industry, and the, the restaurant industry. Uh, so anyway, a lot of great stuff here. I think you'll enjoy it. So without further ado, here's Dominic Armanto. Yes, I understand. I'm being recorded. Yes, I'm being recorded for quality control. Exactly. Did it pop up on your end and say, somebody's trying to record you? I said, okay. It did. I should turn on some kind of background. I don't even remember how to do that. I should know how to do this. Oh, you want a background? Yeah, a, background. Your... background and effects. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> See? Oh, I get the other side. <laughs> Perfection. <laughs> <laughs> Dom, how you doing? I'm good. How about yourself? Doing good. I get to talk to you today. Guy Bruce. Oh, I'll stop it now. You're flattering. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. You got all kinds of stuff going on. I noticed you've been doing more, uh, I guess, food critic. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's more my primary milieu these days. You know, the voiceover is kind of, uh, I mean, honestly, I haven't even really done, aside from Monkey Island, I haven't really done the voiceover since 2007 or so. So, I mean, I've pretty much been out of it for about 15 years now, which I'm not super thrilled about, but, you know. Yeah, um, I was just wondering if you just get bored with it, the work dry No, out. no, not at all. It was just, uh, it was it was really, I mean, the story was that when we went to, uh, in, in 20, 2007, we moved to Baltimore for my wife's work. And mm -hmm. that was supposed to be a two-year fellowship, and our plan was originally to just go back to Chicago. And I kind of tried working remotely out of Baltimore for a while, um, but I didn't have a studio. I was trying to record out of this little closet we had in our, you know, little nine foot wide, uh, row house in Baltimore. And it, it just wasn't, I wasn't getting comfortable and I knew my read wasn't good. So my agent suggested, you know what, you know, I mean, I've, it's the same agent I've been with since I was a little kid and they were like, you know what, we're, you know, we're still going to be here. You know, why don't you just take a couple of years off, take care of your wife, take care of your kid. And when you come back, then we'll just, we'll kind of slot you right back in. And then, uh, uh, then we ended up not going back to Chicago. And then they didn't last much longer. Actually, <laughs> the agency went away. So, uh, so then a couple more moves, and I just never quite, never quite got back to it because you know I'd always been working with the same folks for my whole life. So, um, so at that point, it became a project to kind of get back into it. And I had little kids and the whole thing. So it just kind of, just kind of uh, naturally moved on to other things. I was thinking about your food job playing a. Uh, monkey island and all the, the galley and the disgusting mm -hmm. <laughs> the vichy swaz little yeah. red vichy swaz, yeah exactly. course, you know you've got real life uh, food critic experience i mean if anybody i got crazy these days now, right i know it's so, weird it's a little weird my knowledge of that is i watched a lot of bourdain and uh i, I guess mean, you can do a lot worse than that travel yeah, yeah. What do they call that? The where they travel around the world, and it's about mm -hmm. the food. But you know, that's always good. <laughs> for years, I, it was funny because for years I didn't do that only because, uh, like folks were always shocked. They're like, "Why aren't you watching his show?" I'm like, "Because I'm just if I do, I'm just gonna cry." That we oh, had yeah. little kids and we were kind of stuck and we couldn't do any international travel at the time. And I used to travel like crazy, and then it just kind of stopped cold, and and I was missing it so much. I was like, I, you don't understand. I can't watch this stuff right now. It'll just, it'll break me. It's like, I know we're going to get back to that at some point, but but right now, I just, uh, I can't handle it, so. Well, uh, I think you've eaten at something like a thousand. How many restaurants? Do... Oh, I well, just in Phoenix, I'm at about 1,500 right now. I think I read that your family was quite culinary- uh, you had some not professionally so no uh, my mother's side of the family definitely not my dad was always into good food and good restaurants and he would he didn't cook often but when he did he would cook big you know he'd go he'd go large like my mom was sort of every day-to-day 
dinner and then he would step in like holidays special occasions that kind of stuff uh-huh. and do, you know these incredibly you know these really really ornate and giant feasts um but uh but not that often but no i mean never never anybody in the business at all so um do which is cook, just do you uh, do any cooking or chef kind of work or? yeah professionally no i mean i cook a lot at home i thought about it when i was in my 20s i thought long and hard i, I really you know that was like so so that was the late 90s when i was living in los angeles and i thought about just like there were a couple of restaurants i thought about just walking up to the back door and being like hey look you know i'll start out in the dish pit just teach me um but uh, and that was sort of the era where you know food network was exploding and it was like you know the the celebrity chef era and and uh, that was when uh everybody went out and dropped a ton of money on culinary school and then graduated and realized they had no way to ever make that money back. Um, and I, I was fortunate enough that I knew more, I was not in the business, but I knew more about it than most people who did that. So I was smart enough to stay out of it. <laughs> so I sort of, I've sort of, I sort of found a way to enjoy it and be on the edges without actually having to, you know, work those hours and all that and you know just that that brutal restaurant life so you know i have enough I, episodes I, of hell's kitchen and oh kitchen. god i mean i just just the, i mean the amount of respect for that i have for for people who do that is just you know it's tremendous i mean it's like it's so funny because people ask you know I, I i cook a ton at home and i write about restaurants all the time they're like well have you ever thought of putting up your own restaurant it's like no god no no hell no i know i know enough not to get into that business so um it kind of reminds I, me sometimes of the the martial arts almost and the, the belt system and just the degrees of oh yeah, yeah the, how it's all so regimented and everything yeah it's like almost yeah. militaristic so maybe even beyond exactly uh, but we, you know we probably want to get into the the voice acting and your home. i mean we could if you want to just talk we food that. we could talk about, about games a little bit. <laughs> just yeah, talk exactly, about right? food <laughs> Food games. Yeah, you've been, food so you've been doing this kind of thing. Sorry. Yes. Very long time. 27 years now, I think. Nobody's more surprised than me. So did, what was your first uh, your first gig? Uh you mean my voice over in general or yeah, just in uh, general? Because I, I might I think you did oh, two goes back animation further, yeah. stuff before, right? Yeah, like, no, no, no. No, the the uh the the earliest stuff. I mean, I, I got started when I was I want to say seven years old, maybe eight, something like that. And, um, and, and as a kid, I had wanted to, uh, I wanted to do on camera, you know, I wanted to, do, yeah, I want to do movies. I want to do television shows, that kind of thing, you know, being a kid. Um, and my folks were kind enough to humor me. So I did, you know, I did some theater locally and, uh, and was in the children's choir at lyric opera and, uh, got an agent and started going off and auditioning for all kinds of things and you know i did i did a little bit of work not a lot i never did a lot of on-camera work but i did some some things here and there um but but they just it just so happened that this agency that i was with for on camera they had a very very small one woman basically voiceover department um and uh there's this woman named sharon wiltridge and she's just amazing and uh and at the time it was a very small operation and uh, she kind of caught me in the hallway of the agency one day and we were chatting and she's like, you want to try some voiceover? And I was like, what's that? Because this was the era, of course, when you'd say voiceover, people were like, you know, it's like it's always, like you'd start to explain what voiceover was and they'd be like, oh, yeah, I guess somebody does have to do that. Like, you know, there is an actual job. Yeah, I suppose there does. Yeah, I suppose there is someone who does that job. Right. So it was kind of that era still. And uh, and I was like. Yeah, sure. I'll give it a try. And uh, and she sent me out and I, I I booked the first audition she sent me on. So it just kind of great start went from there. So so most of the work I'd done, like when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, was I just did a crap ton of commercial work because this is in Chicago with all the ad agencies, you know, all the all the theatrical stuff, all the interactive stuff. Well, I mean, interactive didn't even exist at that point. Um, but all of the, uh, you know, shows and movies and all the kind of stuff, that's all West Coast um but uh but chicago was just tons and tons and tons of commercial work which is what i did which is which is how i got started and just a kid doing this yeah i mean it's great i mean it, it's it was like a fun it, life it was, it was a fun oh, it, was, it was so much fun I mean, it was great if you're if you're if you're a kid who can speak clearly can read quickly and can take direction you can make bank doing voiceover i mean it's just because it's, it's, like, it's, it's probably like 0.01 percent of kids right <laughs> well, I, whatever percentage it is, I don't know, but, um, but it's, uh, uh no, it, yeah, exactly. No, I, I mean, I, 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 I fit the bill. 
So, so it, so it worked out great for me. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that paid for college and, and, uh, at least, uh, got me started out in Los Angeles. So, well, the two years of college I went to, but no need to get into that. <laughs> it's incredible. Really. I saw some of you, you were doing some, uh, some anime, I guess, and some. Yeah. A little bit here oh, and there. I got, Godzilla, yeah, there was Godzilla a show. I think I saw in a. Yeah, that was just a guest thing. I did it I, like when I was in. Uh, so when I got out to Los Angeles, I mean, the, the Monkey Island stuff was the big thing that I ended up doing. I had a few small a little bits here and there. I did like, a, you know, a couple of guest spots on, uh, uh, like you said, an episode of Godzilla. I did an episode of uh, Real Monsters yeah, with Plasky Chupo, which is which is kind of what I ended up getting me into. Then I did I, I had a recurring character on Rocket Power for, uh, uh, you know, those old those old Nickelodeon Plasky Chupo cartoons. Um, so I, I had a, one of the, one of sort of the ancillary characters there. And I did the first two or three seasons of that show. And I think at some point they figured I'd be cheaper just to have one of the other guys do my character. So I kind of got the boot, but oh. whatever it happens, uh, it's Hollywood man. Um, and, uh, and some other, you know, like, like a lot of little stuff here and there, nothing, nothing ever big quite popped, but I mean, my, the big one for me was, was, was monkey Island. That was, that was my, that was my my big break, so to speak. And that kind of got me in with LucasArts and I worked pretty routinely with them in a much smaller fashion outside of the Monkey Island milieu. So yeah, I was, was reading my... about that. The, they were impressed that you were such a dedicated fan of the games. Well, that was a tricky line to walk because like on yeah. one hand you're in the audition and I'm thinking, okay, I, I would like to make it clear to them that I know these games way more than anybody else who is auditioning and, and particularly with interactive, that is tremendously valuable because, you know, in these sessions when you have to, there's so much time and consequently money goes towards just trying to explain to the actors what's going on, who these characters are, what the context is, you know, what the scene is like so much, so much time and energy has to go into that, 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 that if you've got somebody who actually knows it all already, I mean, that's just a, it's a tremendous time and money saver because it's so easy for them. So, you know, I wanted to get that across to them, like, Hey, I can make this really easy for you. But at the other hand, you don't want to come across as like, some weirdo fanboy who's gonna you know be all strange about it so you know it's still a very professional i'm a professional so uh so trying to kind of walk that line and uh you know make it clear how i felt about the series without uh without coming across as like eh, i don't know is this guy gonna go funny on us so but it worked out okay i think i, I think i managed to thread that needle just about right i think it probably made it made a difference i, mean, I like to think all the voice actors are, you know, fans of the stuff they're working on. And... Oh, for sure. I mean, it sure helps. I, I I am told after the fact, I was told they said that when it came down to it in the end, they had sort of narrowed it to to me and one other fellow. I have no idea who it was. Um, and that it was very close between the two of us and they were having a really hard time deciding and that that was one of their kind of big tiebreakers was was uh was that the director mentioned to uh Jonathan and Larry the 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 project leads on curse that uh that uh, he says well you know he says this guy's like he knows the games he knows them really well he's a big fan and so so it sounds like that uh certainly I don't know if that was a the deciding factor but it was uh it was one of the uh one of the tiebreakers when it came down to decision time so you started I read a couple of the games you had played you played loom I did on your i guess i, I haven't played record. since i gotta go back and play that again <laughs> no, no, that, was, that was that was my indirect route into my game was because i had uh, i'd received loom as a gift from um some uh some some family friends of ours mm -hmm. uh uh back on i think it was i must have been on pc at the time and uh and uh and they gave that to me as a gift and i played it and i enjoyed it you know it was fun it was cool i thought it was a you know nicely designed game and it's innovative the musical yeah so when i got my sega cd which I was thrilled about. There was a janky system if ever there were one, but you know, I got my Sega CD and I was looking for games for Sega CD and I saw, oh, you know, Monkey Island, uh, Lucas Lucas Arts. Okay, well, I like I, I like Loom. Maybe this will be good. So that was that was what got me there, sort of indirectly. Yeah, you were just a, I mean, it's a really fortuitous time with the CD-ROM technology just just starting to take off. Yeah, like, all these games could suddenly have you know, actual voice acting. And so the, yes. just the text. 
Yeah, no, I think uh, I, there definitely was. I mean, this is always the this is always oh, the story. Mara. Yeah, I mean, this is always the story, isn't it? I mean, it's like you know, there are lots of actors out there who who are who do great work and are talented and 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 you know could do all kinds of things, and then there's always that there's always that right place, right time element to it. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It, there's, there's that, I, I happen to be, I happen to be a big fan of the series. I, I happen to decide to drop out of college and, and move to Los Angeles to go ahead and do it. Or I wouldn't have been there. You know, I just, I happen to have, have played it on Sega CD and gotten into the series. And, you know, so there's always, there's always that element of a uh, of right place, right time. And, and being as someone, you know, I was trying to break into the interactive business we're trying to break into the character work right at the time when, um, you know, the voicing was really starting to become a big thing for games, you know, and, 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 and with LucasArts in particular, who, uh, you know, at the, I mean, it's, it's, I think, I don't know how, uh, you know, if younger gamers think about this kind of thing now, but at the time having good voice work in a video game was very rare. I mean, okay. there were, there were, at that point, there were quite a few. They just games. get the office staff to do the voices, right? Yeah, so. no, exactly. Sure. Not even a joke. Yeah. Just like, you know, grab so-and-so from some cubicle. Oh yeah. He sounds good. You know, pull him into the, the studio and let's do it. And even, or even when they did hire voice actors, it was not, um, you know, I mean, you think about, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of the gag now, but you know, like the original resident evil and you know, those they're, 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 they're hilariously bad at this point, but, but I mean, that really was much more, the norm at the time um so so to have you know this this first rate experienced you know i I mean i was the newbie i was i was the kid who you know i mean i'd been doing voiceover forever but i was new to character work um but i mean you look at the rest of that cast and holy crap and curse of monkey island i mean that is that cast was just stacked with with you know hardcore serious character voice actors who've been doing it their whole lives you know um, doing it for animation and television, all that kind of stuff for for decades, some of them. And uh, and and I mean, that was you you didn't have games like that at the time. So so it really it really stood out in that regard. And I was I was very fortunate to be in the right place in the right time and to be able to, you know, catch on with with a group like that was 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 something. I talked to Flint Dill, a couple of people that have been had sort of some toes or some work with the with Hollywood and doing animation stuff, Hanna-Barbera work, mm-hmm. et cetera. And they, I remember a couple of uh, conversations about when they're bringing voice actors from that realm, you know, they've been doing it forever professionals. And mm-hmm. then they're suddenly working with, you know, some game developer. <laughs> it doesn't have any idea of like the, you know, how that yeah. process works. There's quite a bit of friction. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine that's gotta be, yeah, I mean, and I think I think people are much more conscious of this now. Um, but just the process of working, uh, doing voiceover for interactive is so drastically different, you know, from doing like an animated television show. You know, I mean, I was working on Monkey Island right around the same time that I was a regular on Rocket Power. And 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 just the the, the difference that's so drastically different in terms of how they work. Right. Because for Rocket Power, you got this, uh, you know, it's in one of the old Klasky Chupo cartoons. And and uh, and Charlie Adler was the director who is a tremendous voice actor in his own right. And, you know, he got into directing and he would, you know, we'd book our session, do our episode for the day. And, you know, everyone would kind of get together in the waiting room and hang out for a bit. And then when it's go time, it's like you head into the studio. And at least with Adler, it was like just bang 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 and it's like okay go and you do you know the whole 22 minute episode whatever it is we probably lay it down in 30 35 minutes i mean just blowing through it high energy fast fast go and you're there with the rest of not the entire cast they couldn't get the entire cast to do it once but they would try to get groups together who were in the same scenes together so you're playing off of each other and you're working off of each other And, and in that way um you know it's almost much more almost more like a live performance that they're capturing for animation later. Right. Then you contrast that with something like monkey Island, uh, you know, curse of monkey Island. First time I did that, I did that over the span of, you know, 24, 25, four hour sessions. I would just come in. It was just me sitting in the booth all by myself, me talking to the director, imagining everything else, you know, a few lines at a time, very slow pace, never having anybody else to play off of. And, and I mean, I can just see how if you're someone who's used to that kind of rapid fire, high intensity energy, 
to try to shift into this realm where it's all happening in your head and you've got no one to work off of. And it's not even, you know, it's not even a, a, a structure where, you know, animated script goes from point A to point B and the interactive scripts are just all over the map, just like random lines out of thin air um, because of all the branching dialogue and everything. So, so I, you know, they're, it's interesting because they're both character work, obviously. Um, and the fundamentals are the same, but in terms of the process of getting in the studio, they're so wildly different. So, so I, I can see how that would be a, would have been a difficult transition for a lot of the character actors at the time. I fortunately at that point, I didn't have enough experience to have any habits to break. So, you know, it was, yeah. it was like, for me, this is like, Oh, okay. This is how it is. No problem. Yeah. I remember when I saw that you would have to record some of these lines three or four different ways just because you weren't really sure what the, you know, how it, was it would happen. Yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while. I think they're, they're much, much, yeah, they're a lot better about assembling the scripts now. I like, like nowadays, if I get an interactive script, they're much more, the lines tend to be logically grouped in a way that makes it easier to follow. Um, and I think it's, it's just, you know, these, these folks have had practice with it now, you know, at the time talking about the mid nineties, I mean, yes, you'd have lines from a particular scene or a room, um, but they tended to be much more scattershot and there'd be sort of weird lines. Like you could follow sort of a dialogue tree structure if you're looking at it carefully, but then every once in a while there'd be lo random lines kind of thrown in. And it's like, wait, what is this? What's going on here? And you weren't sure of the context. And, you know, he asked the director, wait, wait, what's going on here? And he's like, oh man, I'm not sure about this one. So yeah, every once in a while we'd run into a line. It's like, okay, we have no idea where this fits in. So we're going to like, imagine like five or six different ways you could think this line would be used and do them all. And hopefully one of them is the way we need it done. Um, so, you know, to try to, to avoid pickups or something getting dropped in, that's all. Right. And every once in a while you play those old adventure games, you'll, you'll catch a line where it's, it's read all the wrong way, you know, and you'll, you'll hear it. It's like, it's you know, like the emphasis is wrong or something very strange about it. And usually that's because, there was a line that got out of place in the script and they just had no idea what it was. And, you know, rather than trying to rebook somebody and get a studio and all the kind of stuff to re-record the one line, it's like, eh, just let it go. So. And my wife and I, we, we played those, all the Nancy Drew games, big fans of those, her, her, her interactive ones. But, you know, the funny thing is whenever you end a conversation with anybody, they tend to say bye or, you know, real <laughs> chipper bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Uh, yeah, context does, is little... it, like clashes so much with like you might have this real serious, you know, yep. <laughs> very annoyed person or whatever, but you still get that chirpy goodbye. <laughs> no, there are a lot of a lot of a lot of those, yeah, lines out of context and just depending on like what the what order you do the dialogue in, things can yeah, it's 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 tricky. And and I think you know that's very much being able to write to that is something that the writers of these games I think have gotten you know much better at over the years. Um, but, uh, but it was still fairly newish at the time. So, so, uh, there was, there's, there's been, there were some growing pains. Okay, now let me sort of turn the tables a little bit here. Sure. I know we got a lot of video game designers and developers that watch this, a lot of, uh, indies. Right. Aspiring to games. I just wonder, like, you know, if one, if somebody's thinking, I would like to have voice actors. And do you have like advice for somebody to like how to make that successful, optimal you know it's I mean, like it's, don's you know <laughs> common it's a, mistakes it's a weird it's a weird it's a weird i don't know it's a it's a weird time right because when i got into it it was very much there were you had those productions that were um just grabbing folks around the office and then you had those rare operations like lucas arts that were you know going through the very well established you know, channels of animation, character voice actors. And there wasn't a lot in between, I feel like, you know, and 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 the and the and the the non-union uh voice actors weren't as plentiful or as organized or as or as good as they are today, right? So it's a very different scene. Um and uh and and so now the interesting thing is that you know, there's no shortage of people out there who want to be voice actors now. I mean, that that was definitely not the case. When I got started, you know, no one even knew what the business was. You know, now it's like everybody wants to be a voice actor because I, it's a great gig. You know, I'm not, it's a fantastic gig. Good work if you can get it. Um, 
So, so the supply is there. Um, and it's the, the tricky thing is I think always this question of, you know, union or non-union, right? And, and I'm, I've been a member of both SAG and AFTRA since I was a little kid, you know, seven or eight years old, um, since back, back when they were two separate entities. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, at the time there was this massive difference in the quality. I think there's, there's less of that now, but it's still, you know, I mean, you want the pros there's 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 a, there's a place to go and 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 i think the thing that's tricky for indies as with all these uh uh with all these scenarios is that uh you know the 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 whole union rules and all that kind of stuff that is not really designed with the smaller publishers in mind and uh and it was funny because i used to I, I would get routinely i would get emails from folks who were fans of monkey Allen. You know, little independent developers, people mostly like more more like hobbyists, you know, not like folks who were doing it professionally at a small scale. It tended to be more um, people who were interested in, and just kind of uh, doing it on the side as a hobby, right? Or wanted to get into the business, develop their own little game. And so I would routinely get emails from them saying, you know, hey, uh, you know, I love Mike Allen. I would love it if you would would voice this for me. And I'd have to tell him, I said, you know, I, 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 I'm flattered. I'm very flattered. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I'm a member of the union and, and, and I take my commitments very seriously and, and, and I can't, I can't do the work unless it's a union gig. Um, so in, you know, in some cases that would be frustrating because it would look like a really cool project that I would like to work on. And in other cases, um, it was a convenient excuse because there were some terrifying projects that I was asked to work on and I wanted nothing to do with. And it was a very polite way of saying, Oh, sorry, man, I can't work on your game, you know, um, but I would always tell them, I said, but hey, you know, if you can, I know that's a lot of hoops to jump through, but if you can get signed up as a union signatory and make it a union gig, then absolutely, you know, then book me like anybody else would, right? Um, and I did this for literally for decades at this point, right? And then uh, you go back a few years ago, I get another one of the emails out of the blue, um, and it's the, uh, the folks doing Lucy Dreaming. Right, the the adventure game that just came out last year, a uh, little tiny little independent uh, husband and wife team out of the UK, and they were like, "Hey, would you be in our game?" And and this one I'm looking at, it's like, "Okay, these guys do great work. It's 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 really wonderful creative work these folks are doing." It's like, oh, I really would like to do this. So I had to give them the standard spiel, you know, oh, no, I can't do it because it's a I'm a union actor, but hey, if you can make it a union gig, great. And about three months later, they emailed me back, they're like, "Okay, we got it done. You ready to go?" And it's like. Holy crap. That's the first time that happened. They actually did it. And it sounds like it was a total nightmare and like 80 bajillion hoops to jump through and, and, and a whole thing, but they, but they, they really wanted to make it happen. And I mean, what's more, what's more flattering than that. Right. So they, so they wrote a small part and uh, that was kind of sort of semi-autobiographical actually, as I, I played a dining critic in the, uh, oh. in, in Lucy dreaming. So, uh, so, so no, it turned out really, really well. And they're, and they're just wonderful folks. And I was really, I was I was simultaneously thrilled that they were able to make it work and and so so guilty that they had to, to jump through all those hoops to make it happen. But I I feel like it worked out well for it. And then they ended up I think I ended up being helpful for them too because they uh, they did not know that Return to Monkey Island was on the way as this was all going on. So they're getting towards the end of their production run and all of a sudden, boom! I'm coming back to do Guy Rashid for Return to Monkey Island. There's a whole ton of press and oh by the way. I'm working on this other game too. And I kept telling everybody, they asked me first, they asked me first before Ron got me for return to monkey Island. So, so they were, uh, even though they were released a little bit later, I was, uh, they were technically the ones who brought me back. So. I guess the lesson there is that one does not simply hire voice actors. <laughs> yeah. It's complicated. I, you know, I, I am, I am thankful that I don't deal with that end of it. How's that sound? I'm glad that I can just get the email or the phone call and be like, yeah, sounds great. Where do I need to be when? So I think I was, yeah, I was just reading. I think the, uh, the actor strike is about to come to the, the world of video games. I was reading it's possible. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we've authorized it. Um, they're in negotiations literally today um, uh, with the, with the major players. I think it's 10 different uh, dev studios that they're in negotiations with. So, so we'll see what happens. Um, it's easy for me to kind of sit on the sidelines because, you know, I haven't, you know, as mentioned, uh, other than Monkey Island, I haven't really been active since about 2007. So, um, so it it's not like it's going to have any large material impact on me if we strike for a while. So it's it's very easy for me to 
to sit on the sidelines, but we'll see what happens. You know, I mean, it's, you know, there's, there are, there are some very important things that were at, at stake. And I think, you know, the, 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 in some ways, the biggest one by far is, 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 is AI. I mean, you know, voice, you know, voice actors and writers are scared. And I, I think, you know, we'll see where the technology goes, but I think they certainly have, whether or not it turns out that way, I think they certainly have, it's reasonable for, it's a reasonable concern. And, you know, there have been enough, issues in the past where uh you know you kind of sleep on something and then it's too late um you know i think of in particular i think about uh, some sort of residual structure for large budget interactive which still doesn't exist um which is which is really a shame you know i mean you have folks who are just absolute cornerstones of some of these massive you know you know hundreds of millions of dollar franchises um and you know you get a 500 dollars session fee and it's like that kind of sucks you know, I mean, not that, not that, not that I'm saying that any, any voice actor, you know, should be paid, you know, tens of millions of dollars to, to, but, but oh, still, know. you know, it's sort of like, it's like, it's like, <laughs> can, can, is, is there some middle ground here? You know, okay. You know, if you have, when you have someone who is really an iconic voice of a, of, 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 of a, of a franchise that's beloved by, you know, tens or hundreds of millions Guy of people. Brush, uh, can, can, can we maybe can we maybe find some some place in between in between you know like you know pro sports ball players and uh and you know the 500 dollars session fee so so uh so we'll see we'll see we'll see what happens yeah i've been hearing about this i mean right now it's mostly i guess they're thinking that these things could or the chat bots or whatever might write scripts and things but it seems inevitable that they will be coming maybe even using videos like this to try to capture the voices and then oh yeah generate- absolutely I don't it doubt. Sound like a legitimate. Uh, we'll you know, see for sure. I, I mean, I'm cu- I'm curious to see how it works out, right? I mean, I'm I'm I mean, like anybody else, I'm curious about the technology. I mean, my my hunch, just this is a totally uneducated hunch, is that it will probably reach the point where it's usable. You know, I don't know that it's going to reach a point where it's great, <laughs> but 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 you know, for a lot of for a lot of devs, usable is good enough, and you know. And there are a lot of purposes where, where you know, I, I think, uh, you know, one thing that I think it, it certainly is working in voice actors' favor, and and this is something that's wonderful, that's so tremendously different than when I got into it, is that is that the public now, the gamers, they know and follow voice actors. Nobody did that when I was when I was getting into it. I mean, back when I was starting out with Guy Street, but nobody paid attention to who was hopping from game to game and who was doing different characters. And I mean, now everyone knows and it's, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, from coming from my end, it's just, it's tremendously flattering to, to be recognized that way. Um, um, and, and it really is, you know, I, I think people have a deeper appreciation these days for, for voice acting in general, you know, in a way that, that they didn't 20 years ago. Um, and so I, you know, I think, I think, you know, if some of that starts to go away, if some of that starts being chipped away, um, then I think, I think people will notice now and they will care, but the question isn't, you know, will we need to have professional voice actors for the main characters in franchise games? I mean, yes, of course we will. That's not going to go away. The question is, you know, all that stuff in the middle, all the, you know, the random throwaway lines and all the, you know, there's a lot of work that isn't necessarily you know that very careful detailed in-depth acting and is that the sort of thing that's going to be that's going to be impacted so i don't know we'll see it's interesting because back you know when i got started it was a tiny small handful of people who did almost all the work um and that's not in some ways it's not entirely dissimilar today i mean you know how it is you see you look at the credits of video games and there are a few names that pop up a lot you know, for, for voicing the, the main characters for games. Um, and um, yeah, well, 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 no, 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 no need to get into that. And it's not, and it's, it's not a, that's not a slight on them. I mean, that was always, that was always the way the, one of the nice things about voiceover was always that if you really got into the inner circle, you know, the folks who are tremendous at it are, you know, it's one thing to hear the character when you're playing a game. It's another thing to be in the studio when they're coming up with character after character after character on the fly and getting description after description. And just like, you know, I mean, I, I always think about when I worked on the Monkey Island games is I got to sit in on a couple of Tom Kane's sessions and he was someone who 
for me was both an inspiration and he also kind of deflated me because, you know, on one hand it was like, this is amazing. Like, this is what I want to do. But on the other hand, it was also like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to do that. I mean, he would just, you could, you could give him anything. He would stand in front of the microphone and just randomly out of the booth and say, okay, we got this character. He's this short little description, you know, and he's like, here's his height and he's from France, but he went to college in Wisconsin and, you know, and, and this and give him the whole thing and his upbringing and okay, here's a few lines go. And he kind of sit and think for a second and then bam. And he'd do it. And you're like, Oh my God, that's it. That's the guy. Right. And, and that kind of versatility made it so that, you know, I understand how it was always, you know, I, there's, there's sometimes some grousing that you keep casting the same people over and over again. But, but on the other hand, when you have actors like that, it's like, why, why hire anybody else at that point? You know, when you have someone who you've worked with for years and years and years, and who has the ability to do that and can give you exactly what you need right on the spot, um, you know, why do you need to cycle through, you know, shuffle through 500 audition tapes, you know, just call Tom. So, so, so I get it. Um, but I, but in some ways I wonder if, um, you know, if, if, if AI voice be actually does become what a lot of people think it could become, if that pushes us back towards that era again, where sort of the volume that didn't used to be there is filled in by that. But then for those really key critical parts, you still have them filled in, but we're back to having, you know, sort of just a, just a handful of folks who can do everything. So why not hire them to do everything? I don't know. We'll see. We hopefully it's not going to be an issue at all because hopefully this is all going to be negotiated and it's going to be like no AI voices, got to hire everybody and we're done. At least, you know, selfishly from, uh, from my perspective. Yeah. So it's just been hard for me to separate the, I guess there's a lot of speculation about about it and it's the hype, you know, and trying to just cut through yeah. that and figure out like what's what's the real issues. But you know, I've uh, been interested in game stories and narratives and things like that for a long time, and yeah, thinking about some of the, you know, arguably some of the limitations of the adventure game genre, in particular. People talk about well, you know, once you've been through it, you know, they're given the same lines over and over again. Why couldn't we have an, an AI in there as a character to just generate? you know, fresh dialogue every time. And, you know, I could sort of see the potential of that, but, you know, it seems like we're, you know, that's like distant future. <laughs> it's what it feels like to me at the moment, but maybe it's, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's like, it, it's like anything else, you know, and, you know, NFTs were going to rule the world a couple of years ago and, you know, we can see how yeah, that all <laughs> worked out and, 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 and it could be the same case with, you know, with the uh, with AI developing, you know, voice and scripts and all that kind of thing. Now it could be something that just ends up totally fizzling. Um, I tend to be skeptical. I, I tend to, I tend to think that the technology is amazing, and it will be, and I'm sure it will be useful. Right? I tend to be very skeptical that it's going to be able to produce anything uh, serious. Hundred percent. You uh -huh. know, but but then I think to myself there are a lot of people out there who really don't care if it's any good. I mean, honestly, there's, there are people, there, you, there's no shortage of people there who will buy crappy writing. So I can guarantee you, know, you I don't know. if you tried to replace Ron Gilbert with some kind of chat. Oh bot, yeah. I mean, yeah, forget that's, about it. I mean, no, but if that's play. ever possible, that's, you know, <laughs> that's sci-fi. That's not, that's not, that's not current events. That's sci-fi. Um, but but you know there are a lot of there are a lot of there are a lot of products that sell you know there's turn on the television there's no shortage of shows with just dumb dumb by the numbers scripts you know so I don't know we'll see we'll see I, I you know I, I I like to think that the uh, I like to think that the, in some ways in some ways the best way to deal with the AI threat is is to get people to appreciate great work. You know, because the great work is not going to be replicated anytime soon, no you know, so do great work and, you know, get it in front of people and 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 make them appreciate great work, you know, get them, get them. It's like, you know, you got to same thing with the food, you know, it's like you got to it, it takes effort to wean people off of cheap, lousy, fast food. You know, I mean, that's there's 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 junk and there's good stuff. And it's not that we don't all consume our fair share of junk that's you know that happens but but 
but you know, it takes trying to, to, to open people's eyes to what things can be, um, can be a slog. I mean, it's, it's work. Uh, it's constant work. You know, you kind of just keep, keep, keep pushing that boulder, keep pushing that boulder. Hey, you know, I understand you like this, but check this out. You know, look at, look at, you know, look at how this story, you know, it's so deep and it's so wonderful. And there's so much more going on here than, you know, this kind of junk you're consuming over here. You know I mean? It's uh, people, people, it takes a little handholding, I think sometimes to, uh, to get folks to kind of cross that bridge and appreciate um, something that is going the extra mile and doing something special. And if we can do that, then, then it's not an issue. So I've noticed something similar with the world of micro brews and <laughs> absolutely <laughs> beer at all. I mean, yeah, it's such a relief. You know, it seems like there's so much more interest in that now and people can appreciate, well, yes, this particular ale might be three or four times more than the Budweiser, but you yep. know, you're, <laughs> there's so 100%. much more here than, you know. Yeah. I mean, you look at the difference between what people drank 15 years ago and what they do now. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, but, but, you know, that, think of how how many freaking brewers you know and, and you know just to that that constant constant it's always working it's always you know and that's what i see you know to push the analogy you know like you're like in the food world you know you have you have, you have folks in a, in a in a town like phoenix running restaurants and it's like and one of the things that's difficult here is is there are so many people running restaurants here who know that what they're doing is so much better you know and I, you know i see that i know that and, 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 and trying to these folks who are like, you know, how do I, how do I get people to understand this? You know, how do I get people to see that, look, this is $2 more than a combo at McDonald's. And yet it's this, you know, just beautifully, perfectly crafted piece of, you know, this beautiful, fresh baked bread and these fantastic ingredients. And, you know, it's like, and trying to get people to see that difference it just it just takes time because you know the 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 way things are you know just the you know the 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 advertising and the and the and the the, the amount of money that goes into pushing junk is just you know it's hard to, that's hard to fight it's hard to fight and it's hard to you have to get people it's hard to get people to pay attention you know i think they don't even think about it half the time you know i think most people if you put something in whatever the context, you know, we're talking food, we're talking video games. You put something that is just kind of bleh, thrown together by the numbers and you put together something that's really special. You show it to them side by side and you have them do it. People usually can tell the difference, you know? Um, but a lot of times it's just, it's just opening their eyes and making them aware, you know, it's like, take a moment and and see it and think about it. And, and, and it's always so gratifying when, when, you know, you can kind of see that, that aha moment when someone all of a sudden is like, Oh my God, you know, like I get it. I see the difference, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I think that that's, that's, that's true everywhere is that, uh, you know, we're all so busy and doing 80 bajillion different things. And so beaten down that it's like, it's hard to even see, but seeing that is, that's like, that's what, that's what we're living for. You know, it's like, that's the whole thing. You know, what's the point of doing anything if we're not appreciating, you know, the, the beauty and the artistry around us. So so, so, you know, I, there's, there's certainly, this all ties into a, a larger philosophical metaphysical uh, uh, struggle here on a societal level. So, so there's that boy, I just zoomed Wait, out. Like, philosophy. Out. I don't know where, how did I get there? Sorry. I don't know where, I don't know where that came from. Well, we were talking a little bit, of, uh, you know, you said that things are changing or have changed from the days when maybe people didn't know the names of the, yeah. but you know, I could say, even as a kid, I, you know, if if, if they're like well, they're coming out with a new Monkey Island game, you know, if I heard that, my first question would be, well, are they going to have the same voice? Talent? Yeah, I don't want to hear know. some other voice. <laughs> I, is it? I, you know, I say that. I say that, and yet, and yet, in it, it's it's strange to me. It's strange to me that like I was one of the weird exceptions. You know what I mean? I mean, that, like I said, that I mean, I don't, I don't. Maybe maybe my view on this is skewed, but I, you know, I. I, I I don't recall seeing in like even in, even within even within games media at the time I don't recall there being a lot written about who was portraying a voice unless it was some unusual scenario like you know oh Tim Curry is doing the main character for uh, for Gabriel Knight you know of yeah, course then pay attention because it's freaking Tim Curry right but aside from that um, 
yeah, on one hand, I say, yeah, people didn't do this. But on the on the other hand, I was one of the few people for whom people would do this back in the day. So um, which is especially weird to me because, you know, I mean, I, I have never I have never thought of myself, nor am I by any um, stretch of the imagination, you know, like some major player on the voiceover scene. You know, I mean, I I did I did I did some work in my day, but, you know, I'm not like. You know, I'm not like the folks who are who are just going nuts doing AAA games left and right these days. I mean, that's not. I I had a, I had a very, I had a, a a I had a career with a lot of little stuff and one very very popular important niche character that became mine. Um. So so it's it, it's it, it always feels. I, I still in some way I feel like an outsider still, um. Mm-hmm. Which is which is a weird place to be. Um, but it is what it is. So, but yeah, so, 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 I mean, I, it, it is, it is amazing to me. You know, I think about that. Yeah. That, that, that people, and people will say that, you know, is, is, is Dominic still, you know, on, and this is funny. This ties in too. It's funny because when, when, no when for me, they're like, no, we got this. Other... Ron, uh, so when Ron, <laughs> we got this Ron... AI instead. No way. I'm not yeah. playing that. So this is funny too, though, because when Ron, uh, uh, you know, got the green light and, and started working on return, um, you know, he told me after the fact, he said that one of the things he was just really scared about, like one of his biggest stress points was, would I come back and do Guybrush, you know? And I was like, dude, <laughs> I'm the last person you need to worry about. It's like, what, what are you saying? You know, it's been good, but I'm not really interested. Thanks anyway. It's like, no, it's like, I'm, I'm basically sitting by the phone waiting for your phone call for 12 years. You know, what I mean? it's like. He's like, I know, I know, but I think he was concerned. He's like, yeah, but if you wouldn't or couldn't for some reason, I was like, all right, that's fair. But still, it's like, come on. It's like, you know, what am I, what am I going to do? This is the, what I, what I, I love this. You know, what can I, how can I not love this? Of course I'm ready. I'm tell me where and when I'll be there. So. I don't really, I've never spoken. I've never met Ron, just, you know, I've read a lot of his writing, you know, through these games. I kind of get an impression yeah. of what he must be like. But, you know, does he kind of match his, his writing persona? He, or is he... he is, he is re- you know, in, in a way, yes. I mean, you know, he's got the whole, there's the whole grumpy gamer shtick. Um, and, and you know, he is, he is someone who is not shy about expressing his frustrations. Um, but he is also, and I don't know if it, I don't know if it comes through or not in his writing. It's hard for me because, you know, I know him at least a little bit on a personal level now. And he's, he's just, he's just a sweet guy. You know, he's just, he's just, he's just so mellow and sweet, you know? And I think, and I think um, when he gets grumpy or frustrated about things, it's because he is such a mellow and sweet guy. And it's because something has hurt him. You know what I mean? Something that for a lot of us, would be just you know an annoyance or whatever you know for him you know he he feels that i think he's someone who feels things very deeply and i think that comes across in his writing um and uh and so i think i think when that uh you know when he sort of falls into his grumpy gamer shtick that's usually coming from a point that's usually coming from a place of caring enough to become grumpy about something Mm -hmm. so um so I think that's really, you know, I think that's really where it is not to get, uh, not to get too personal about it, but he's, he's, he's a really, he's a cool guy. He's a really cool guy. Both he and Dave are just, you know, really wonderful people who I wish I had, you know, I, I, I wish I were not separated by half a country from, cause I'd, I'd love to spend more time just being able to hang out with them professionally or otherwise. So, and, and it was, it was really nice to be able to have the chance to do that a little bit um, with, with return. It was, it was, it was big for me to be able to go and actually spend time with the folks who created this whole thing in the first place so yeah i think that's one of the things that makes the game so much fun to play is always feel like these guys you know whoever ron you know they've i feel like they really understand me (laughs) and that they they understand people you know it's like you it's like hanging out with your you know best smartest uncle or something (laughs) yeah well i mean that's why i mean both of them it's like i say they're both they're both i think they're both very I think they're both very sensitive fellows, you know, who, who, who are, who are very observant of human nature. And, and, and when you're someone who can do that, you know, people say that, you know, I feel, I feel like they know me, you know, they, they see themselves in, 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 in the work. Right. And that's because it's made by people who see things in people, you know, and, and who are very, 
um, very reflective, I think, both about human nature in general and about themselves as well. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, as they made very clear in, uh, you know, particularly in the letter at the end of the game is, you know, this in, in many ways, it's a, it's a very autobiographical piece for them. The series in general has been largely, um, but particularly return. And, uh, um, you know, but they're, they're, they're fellows who know how to tap into these universal human themes, you know, and, and these, you know, this, this is not, I mean, it's not, like they say, it ain't, it ain't rocket surgery, you know. I mean, this is this is storytelling. It's a storytelling one hundred and one, right? I mean, it's 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 myth and Joseph Campbell and you know these these truisms about human nature that uh, have always been with us and are always going to be. And, and those are a couple of guys who who understand it. And then by extension, they understand everybody because they understand you know they understand people. I was really glad to see this uh, latest game. You know, I, I remember when I was reading some of your other interviews and things. Now you talked about how there was this big gap between the second game and the third game. Like was it like a six year some gap in between there. And I remember back at the time, I always it always annoyed me to read these magazines, the gaming uh, press. It kept on saying adventure games are dead. Nobody yeah. wants to play it. I mean, it, that always just seems to come back. You know, <laughs> same thing with role playing games. But <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm glad that it didn't end there with the second game. No, I am too. I and I and 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 it's it um it, it that was that was not the closure anybody won. You know, I mean, I, it was not even getting it was into fun. The it was interesting. Um, and 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 I like to think that I am uh uh you know like I as a teenager I was uh, I was like a I was a hardcore artsy European film geek too. So so you know I like to think that I am unusually comfortable with ambivalent endings or not ambivalent, you know, with, with ambiguous, ambivalent, ambiguous endings, excuse me. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, that was, that was maybe pushing it a little bit for, uh, you know, but I don't think it was intended to be an, an ending. Um, I, you know, it's, I'm, I'm glad that they, I'm glad that they had a chance to circle back and, uh, and, and do what they wanted to do with it. Um, so, yeah. Let's see. I got a question here. Matt Bradley, sure. You, chimed in a few that I, I thought were pretty clever uh yeah this is uh, something i've thought about too so when you were playing it on your sega cd yeah did you make up voices did you like read dialogue out loud i mean was this did you like rehearse was this practice or no you know it's funny because i must have I, at least heard a voice in your head you know that was the, the thing is i didn't for guybrush i mean the thing is i just i thought of him as me which i say is that what everybody does i don't know you know, I mean, I think the whole point is that you kind of, you know, you kind of put yourself in there, right? I mean, that's that's who Guybrush is, um, which which was how I ended up getting around to what I did for him, you know, because when it came time to do the audition, you know, and I had my, you know, seven minutes in the hallway, whatever it was before I had to go into the studio and actually do this thing and, you know, do this audition that for me personally was like going to be the most consequential thing ever because it's like, I'm going to get this role. I just have to figure out how I'm going to do it. Um was uh was trying to figure out well what do i what do i actually do with this now now that i got this opportunity in front of me you know and and that was sort of what i ended up falling back on you know i i, I kind of went through that rapid cycle of you know character voices and doing this and that and i kind of was playing with things in my head in the hallway and talking out loud a little bit and well, i could try this or i could try this and none of it quite felt right and then i just thought you know what i've been doing this for years on my own already and i always just kind of I, you know, I wasn't saying it out loud, but I always just kind of heard it in my own voice because he's the protagonist and, you know, I'm close enough and, and, and I can always work for me. So maybe it'll work for everybody else. I don't know. I'll just give it a try. So, so I just kind of, it could have easily you know, gone really badly, right? With the, it could have. Yeah. But no, but I figured yeah, I mean, it sounded it, anything like what you would It's not like it wasn't embracing the character too. I mean, you know, the thing about voiceovers is there's always, you know, there's, I don't want to oversimplify, but you know, there's two sides of it. You know, there's like the actual vocal quality performance side of it and there's the acting side of it you know and i think people less so these days i i i i love that the public is more appreciative of the acting side of things these days you know but the thing that i always tried to impress upon people who wanted to go into voice acting was always like just forget about the voices because they would always come to me with you know silly voices like oh i can do all these silly voices it's like that's that's great but it's like that's not what it's about you know that's not that is important and you need to be able to, you know, modify and do different things, you know, unless you want to have a very 
narrow path, which is fine. There are some people who, you know, have a very narrow, there's a character that they do and very slight variations they're on. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. The people who make great careers out of that, but it's like, it's not about silly voices. You know, it's about, it's about the acting. You are acting, you are acting. That's what it's about. So, um, so I think, uh, uh, um, just totally lost my train of thought. Crap. Where do we start out with on this one? About the acting. Wow. <laughs> Dropped out of my head. Um, yeah. The, 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 uh, you're, you're, uh, you what know, was that? Sorry? Parrot, you know that? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I would have imagined, I could have so easily imagine somebody thinking, well, it's a pirate game. So I need to sound like one of those, you know. Really yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. Office. So, but I mean, the, and the whole thing about Monkey Island 2 is that, you know, it's the the whole, sh- half the shtick is that it's this anachronistic thing. Yeah. And we're never really sure if he is actually a pirate or not. I mean, let to be fair, if people are being observant and picking up breadcrumbs, you know, there's always, you know, the whole flooring inspector thing. It's like, is that a joke? I don't know if it's a joke, right? Um, so, so I just, I just thought, okay, the play, the way to do this is, I'll, I'm just going to play it really straight. I'm going to play it really straight, and 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 I'm going to, you know, I know the character because I've been living with the character as a fan for many, many years, and I'm just going to take the aspects of my personality that you know, take the Venn diagram and those parts in the middle where we match up, I'm just going to crank those up to 11, you know, and then just kind of fill in the rest and, and make it do him the way that he's been very genuine to me. You know, you know, if, if, if you're playing the game and you're thinking of him as yourself, that can't not be genuine, right? Because it's coming from you. Um, and I think that's, and that's really, I think part of what was so important about Guy Bridge is, is, you know, the people around him can be sort of silly, wild caricatures um, and it'll still work. Um, But Guybrush has to be genuine. If he stops being genuine, you know, I mean, there's plenty of shtick, you know, I know, of course, when I do the character, there's, there are plenty of lines that are goofy and performative and all that kind of stuff. But if that isn't grounded and coming from a very genuine place, it, it doesn't work. It will not work. It will immediately fall flat. So, so for me, you know, doing it in the way I always thought of it as coming in for me and the ways I connected with this character that helped me to keep it very genuine. You know, this is, this isn't just the character I'm playing. This is a little piece of me too. And that hopefully, I, I think maybe that's part of what made it work because then it, it, it was real, you know, it was real. It wasn't just a character. So, and I think in, for this, for Guybrush Threepwood, that's part of what makes him tick. So much of it is like this, the the dynamics among the characters. I was watching uh, yeah. the the pirate song on Sea Cucumber. I was watching that that scene again. <laughs> yeah. And you really notice that because you got these you know really sort of different voices and voice characters, oh. and then you know it works. So it wouldn't work as well, I think, if it was if everybody was doing that. No, you, know, you sort of need Guybrush there to you know because it's like the I guess all this originated or was inspired by that ride, the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. You know, so it, it kind of feels like this, like you're the kid on the ride. You don't, the kid's yep. not supposed to be <laughs> the same yeah. as the old one. And, and the voice director, the voice director on Curse, Daryl O'Farrell, he, you know, again, this was when I, so I'm just starting out with doing interactive voiceover. And he made a, a, a tremendous point to me early on um, was that he said, you don't, for a main character of a game like this, you don't want to do too much because you know, any other character, you're going to go in, you're going to have a scene with him and you're going to move on. It's like when you're talking about the main character in an adventure game like this, people are going to spend just hours and hours and hours with you. And he said, if you do too much with it, and if it's too much of like a character, it just gets old and tiresome and get old and tiresome really quickly. So, so in some ways that, that character that, that you are playing and that who is the one you're spending the most time with has to be a little more normal. Uh, and a little less, you know, wild and crazy, um, because otherwise the players just get worn out. And that was something that I hadn't thought of at the time, but, but it, I mean, it, it ended up working out great. You know, I mean, the, the fact that I did it the way I did dovetailed nicely with that. And that, and that, that session doing the song was, I mean, it's a totally separate thing, but that was like, that was, that was maybe the most fun voiceover session ever, ever, ever. The only time I've ever gotten you wrote a song it, for that, didn't you? The, What's that? The songs are your, uh, you wrote those, right? Or not something. that not one. Yours, so so in, in, yeah, in, in, in Curse of Monkey Island, uh, uh, the, what, the way it happened was you had, you know, the scene in the Barbary Coast with the, uh, the pirate barbershop quartet. 
And I, Fabulous. folks were calling, I, I desperately want to be a part of this and I want to audition. So what they had done was they had written those, those little audition snippets, like lines from five or six different songs. They had written lyrics for those, but had no tunes. So, so I, you know, I go into the studio and I'm recording in the morning and we get to this point and, 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 and Dara, the director tells me, says, Hey, you know, we got the lines here. We don't have any tunes. He's like, can you just kind of make something up? And I told him, yeah, I'm sure I can do something. I said, but, but do me a favor. I said, can we set these aside and let me like over lunch, let me think about it a little bit. And then let's come back and do those after lunch. So yeah, sure. No problem. So I spent lunch that day, you know, like one was like the goofy jingle and the others was like a sea shanty and a national anthem and, you know, all these different styles. So for each of them, I was just kind of over lunch, I was kind of thinking through in my head, you know, like some tunes and cadences that would, you know, that would work for those types of songs. So that was, that was my contribution musically was I, 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 I did the tunes. They had already written the lyrics and I did the tunes for those. Then I am told what had happened is those went so well, you know, uh, Dara packages up and sends the stuff back to Jonathan and Larry to listen to, you know, as, as he would do, you know, as, as we're going through production and they got to those and they were so thrilled by it that they thought, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we added like a musical number? And at that point they went to Michael land and said, Hey, can we, can we work on something? And then, and then Mike Land wrote the, you know, the pirate I was meant to be that whole, the whole production number in the middle of curse. Um, so, so that's, I, I, I it's to my understanding, that's how it them. came to be. What's that? I mean, that's one of the, it's a great thing to be uh, associated with them. It's one of the high points, I think. Of the... I know I, it, that, that session was, that session was nuts and it was nuts. And part of the reason it was so much fun is I was the only singer in the bunch. It was, it, it, you know, those, all those guys, every single one of them, tremendous actors not a singer among them could not carry a tune it was holy which which worked which worked but oh my gosh that session was nuts <laughs> like halfway through it was funny too because we're trying to and 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 dara is he was a voice director too he's not a musical guy either so about halfway through i kind of leaned at Dara. i'm like can i take control of this he's like dude go for it so yeah i kind of i kind of stepped in and you know kind of tried to, to direct a little bit musically and it came out it, i mean it turned out so well you know that that little bit of jankiness is is kind of what makes that whole number i think so you know, i'm kind of curious what it would what it felt like for you having played the games being such a fan then you get to be the voice and then you get to see and hear the voice coming out of <laughs> guy brush uh, how did that make you feel did that part of it, oddly, um, is not the momentous reaction you might expect, because for me, it was like, yeah, that's how I've always heard them. <laughs> you, know, I mean, you know, I mean, yes, it's coming out of the PC speaker this time instead of out of my mind. But but it's but but for me, it wasn't even so much of a thing because that's that was how I'd been playing them for years. You know, um, the more shocking difference to me was just that the, the, the where where the shock for me came in was just that notion that oh crap, I hope everybody else likes it. I mean, you know, this works, I know this works for me, but at this point, you know, stepping into the middle of this tremendously beloved franchise, um, you know, that's that's a little intimidating, you know, to suddenly put voice for the first time to a character. Because I know, I think to myself, you know, this is how I've had it heard in my head for the past seven or eight years. I'm like, everybody else has been hearing something else for the past seven or eight years. And I have to convince every single one of those people that my version's better um and uh and that's that's a little scary but you it seems run the people it. that you know they, they listen to you for a while and then they're like you know that your voice sounds familiar that has never happened <laughs> not once not a single no, time never 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 not never like a gaming convention or anything never once the only time the only time anyone has ever pegged me in public for something like that all, it was because it was because on, on my car a couple of years ago, I told myself I would never get a vanity plate. And then finally I was like, ah, oh, screw it. And I got a guy brush license plate, right? My license plate says guy brush. And I think twice someone That's has been awesome. like, oh, monkey Island. Right. And, and I don't in either case, and certainly in the second one, it was hilarious. Cause the guy pulls me over. I was like, Hey, you see, I'm in the parking lot getting out of my car. I was like, Hey, is that, is that a monkey Island reference? It's like, it totally is like, Oh, it's awesome, man. And then he goes on his way. It's like, should I tell him? Nah, I figure people would be trying to get you to do some insult sword fighting with them, and <laughs> never, never in person. Plenty online when they know who I am. But no, it's it's I, I'm uh, it's it's not something that people it's not something that people recognize in person, or at least if they do, they didn't say anything about it. It's never it's never it's never come up. But I wonder no, how much no autograph do. lines, no, uh... no, and I mean there's I but I 
we one could say that this illustrates how again it's not about the voice it's about the acting right because i sound like guybrush my everyday voice i didn't do really i didn't do much for guybrush other than just kind of give it high energy bring it up in range a little bit but, you know the actual the tone of the voice is pretty much me but it's a different character so you know i think that if anything that 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 kind of that that proves the point it's not about it's not about the voice. It's about the character. You know, people are encountering me in everyday life. I may, the voice may be there, but the character is different. So. Here's a good one. I'm curious what you say about this. So what surprised you the most working with Ron on Return to Monkey Island? Would it be weird to say that nothing surprised me about working <laughs> with Ron? No, I mean, I, I had, I had, I, I mean, it was, it was it was exactly what I expected. It was exactly what I expected. I mean, he's just, uh, you know, I I had met him before return. You know, we had had a chance about what it was about ten years, twelve years prior, um, when I was doing uh, promotional stuff for uh, the special editions and for Tales of Monkey Island for Telltale. Mm -hmm. um, they had invited me out to PAX to come out, hang out, do interviews, that kind of thing. So, and at that point, that was the first time I met Ron. And that was terrifying the first time I met him um, for the same oh, reason, for the same reason. Well, absolutely. hundred percent for the same reason, except for the same reason that it was terrifying to do the voice in the first place for all these existing fans, except a thousand times because it was his creation. That same thing, oh, that, that thing of, you know, this is, you know, this is his baby, you know, it's his baby. And, and, you know, he created this and it's, you know, his, his, he's done a lot of tremendous work that people appreciate. But if you ask people like, what's Ron Gilbert's biggest contribution to video gaming, people are probably going to say Monkey Island, you know? And and then the circumstances of how, you know, it was kind of left unfinished and he left LucasArts and, you know, the nature of the business, it doesn't belong to him anymore. So I'm I'm thinking if I'm in Ron Gilbert's shoes, here is, here is my baby. Here's the thing for which I'm most known and I poured my heart and my soul into and it's not mine anymore and I didn't get to finish it the way I wanted. And then after I left, they cast some stinking kid to voice the main character of my game you know and i could think of 80 million ways that even nice people would have been very irked by that situation you know um and and i was scared that you know what if he hates it what if he hates it what if he thinks to himself that's not what i envisioned for guybrush at oh, all that that's sucks. not what i you know what I mean? Yeah, no, exactly. And um, and if if that's the case, he is he is graciously never let on. If that's the case, I feel pretty comfortable at this point that he is happy with my work. Um, so so that's tremendously validating. But but yeah, no, that's 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 a little intimidating to to step in and you just you know I was just I was I hope I hope I didn't even hope that he loved what I did. I was just I hope that he was okay with what I did. You know, I just hope he's okay with what I did. At least, you know, when I, when I, when I met him that first time, um, what did, what did you say? Was, we didn't even really talk about it, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> but no, which, is, which is a good thing, right? Because it was just, you know, we were just hanging out, you know, what, what are we going to do? We're going to, we're going to meet. And then we're going to have this deep, deep discussion about monkey Island. It's like, no, we're two guys and we're meeting and oh, we finally get a chance to say hello. And, you know, we got to hang out a little bit over the weekend and, you know, the whole team went out to dinner one night, a nice restaurant, and Ron came along. So, you know, I got, I got a chance to, to, to sit and chat around and, and get to know him a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and just based on that, and, you know, of course I see the, 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 you know, the things he writes as, as, as anybody does, you know, no, I think working, I think working with him um, and with Dave, it's, it's, it was exactly, it was exactly what I expected in, 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 in the best possible way. I mean, you know, you come to know, I feel like, okay, I can't say this universally because there are plenty of people where you see their work and you think they're wonderful and they turn out to be monsters. I mean, that happens every yeah, day. Yeah, don't, so don't meet that. your heroes. That's yeah, it. exactly. I can't say that. But, but, but I feel like, you know, between meeting them earlier on, and, and of course, you know, Dave was working for Telltale at the time too. So I met Dave that way too, you know, between um, uh, meeting them early on and, and getting to know them through their work, um, you know, they're, like I said, I think they're, they're both tremendously talented, thoughtful, sensitive people. And, uh, and, and I was, I was not, I was not surprised. That's what it's what I expected. And that's exactly what it was. If anything, the only surprise was that I had such high expectations for what they were going to do and that they managed for me to even go past that. You know, when I played that first build of the game, 
you know, I knew that return was going to be, I had a good sense that return was going to be very thoughtful and very introspective and, you know, very, you know, brilliantly done and subtly done. Yeah. Um, but even with that expectation, when I first played through one of the early year builds, it was still like, wow. I mean, they, they really went above and beyond my expectations even. So, so that's the only, that's the only way I can say I was surprised. And I, I was, I was not surprised, but gratified by the extent to which they were really happy to just let me go in the voiceover sessions. I mean, they, there was always one of them on the line listening, ready to jump in with a comment or a clarification or something. Um, but, um, but they really were content, you know, it was, it, you know, Chris Brown is the director and she's an old, old friend of theirs from the, from the early LucasArts days. Um, and, uh, and they really were content to just let Chris and I, you know, blow through it and to let me do my thing. Um, and, and I think if there's, if I ever needed true validation that yes, they are in fact happy with my work, that was it. The fact that they were, that they could just sit there and let me do it and not feel the need to, you know, jump in and, and, and micromanage and do any of that kind of stuff. So, so, so I think if that means what I think it does. We're yeah, pretty happy. A lot of fun. I mean, that game, especially for someone that you know played the early ones and coming back to it after all these years. What a right in the feels, man. Wonderful right thing. Yeah, this is a, yeah, the feels. <laughs> I mean, particularly for you know, because I you know, and again, we talked a little bit about how the series in general, but particularly Return, is very is very autobiographical for them. You know, there's there's a lot of human nature. You know, those whole those 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 ruminations on aging and your place in the world and 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 what your work does and doesn't mean to people and and uh, you know and kind of you know someone who's who's been at the center of attention and then kind of you know maybe not for a while and it's like you know for for me too it's like I'm following kind of there are a lot of parallels here and I'm getting a little misty while I'm playing this game so um, so yeah I mean and and I think the fact that they that they did so that they did it so subtly, you know, that it was done. So with such, you know, it was just gentle and kind of tender and, and it wasn't reaching for effect, but there, you know, those, those, the waters run deep in that game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I really, I, I really think they knocked it out of the park. I like this question too. I think Matt's, I think I know where he's going with this. We'll see what okay. <laughs> you know, set up. It must be yeah you, know, you start talking about monkey island games and of course the endings come up a lot you know sure obvious reasons uh but yeah the ending of return went to monkey island very emotional yep people talking about it uh so the question is when you play guy brush at the end locking i guess a little bit of a spoiler alert here maybe uh, <laughs> locking stuff up you know turning off the yeah, tracks yeah. and people probably know <laughs> if you play the game <laughs> Uh, did you approach this with some kind of finality or was it just a regular day at work? Right? No, I mean, you have to, right? I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, that's what it is. That's, that's how it's, that's how it's laid out. That's, that's what's in the script, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, selfishly, I sure hope it's not the end. I mean, and of course it hasn't, it's turned out not to be at least in some, to some degree with Sea of Thieves, you know, we'll see what happens mm -hmm. going forward. Um, but, um, you know, if not finality, then closure, you know, I mean, closure doesn't have to mean the end, right? You can, you can have closure on something and things can continue on. Um, but, but a bit of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind of element too. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I, and I think, uh, you know, it's funny because um, on one hand, it's like, you know, on one hand, it's, you know, finally the great revelation. And on the other hand, it's like the great revelation is kind of like, I mean, you guys, this has kind of been sitting right in front of you the whole time. You know, I mean, it's, I kind of feel like it's it, it, it was funny to me afterwards um, reading a lot of the comments online because, you know, there were a lot of people who were still kind of like, well, well, it could mean this. Right. And it's like, dude. <laughs> It's like, just let it, let it be what it is. You know, it's like, it's not, I feel like, I feel like they're making it pretty plain for you here. You know, it doesn't have to be anything more than that. And that's, um, uh, uh, but, uh, but in terms of, in terms of, you know, performing it, in terms of approaching it, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the way it's written. I mean, there is, there is a, there is a circle being closed here, right? And, and, and you have to play it that way. And, and it's so, and I, and I love that too, because, you know, Guybrush is a character where 
uh, there's a lot of silly, energetic, flippant stuff. Um, the introspective moments are few. Uh, in fact, if anything, Guybrush, Guybrush's thing is that he is anti-introspective. It's just plowing forward. I am going to achieve my goal and not taking a moment to think. Um, so when he does take a moment to think and reflect, it is so rare uh, that it is vitally important uh, to to highlight the 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 depth of his introspection in those crushed moments when he is shutting down the the lights or when he's fallen off a cliff or whatever you know one of those one of those i've just gotten the crap kicked out of me and 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 my bravado is turned off for maybe only 90 seconds but long enough to to do a little bit of introspection um so so yeah i mean it's there there's there needs to be weight there or it does not work there has to be and there is i mean and, and the other thing it's it's not like you have to reach for it i mean it's right there you know what i mean as as a performer, it's like they say it's one of those old cliches, but it's like you know, good writing makes acting easy. When good the writing. words are on the page, when the good words are on acting. the page, makes acting easy. Yeah, I just I felt, you know, the funniest scenes. I told you a little better on the email, but the thing with the mop and the getting the chips off the the tree and the little cute animals. <laughs> Love it. Love I mean, it. I had to just stop for a while and just. I know, like, right. <laughs> and wow. I love that. I love that. I love that so we got. Fun. We, we I mean, got it's a good sort of, example too. Just like, no commentary. Just oh, we got oh what? <laughs> I love. I love. That we sort of have our. We have just it's just one of those. Yeah. One of the more one of the more uh, aggressive reminders of Guybrush's chaotic neutral nature. You know, mm -hmm. he's not. He's not out to hurt anybody. But he just maybe isn't really paying attention to what is happening in his wake. You know, he's very he's very goal oriented and very focused. And uh, whatever happens to the people going up to the scene and critters, like, okay. and critters and and fauna around him, um, he may only realize later in retrospect is not the best thing to do. You know, you're playing this game and you're thinking maybe the audience is intended to be small kids you know children playing this because there's children characters and you kind of build up this expectation that everything's going to be somewhat kid friendly you know then you get that just like wow so funny i mean because it totally breaks that you know pattern that's kind of been building up. oh i have the image in my i have the image in my head of like some kid playing the game and i just like ah, busting out tears. And honestly <laughs> it's, honestly in my head it's a beautiful thing it's perfect <laughs> yeah, those kind of things it's good for kids right Absolutely, they're resilient. Yeah, it's like Terry yeah. Gilliam used to say: "If you drop them, they'll probably bounce." <laughs> I had a question. I do have a question about Sea of Thieves. Yeah, how do you approach playing the older guy, Brush, going through some similar scenarios from the first game? Well, okay. Well, so 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 Sea of Thieves. I mean, technically, if you're gonna get technical about it, we're gonna get you know in 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 canon that's kind of middle time wise, right? Because mm -hmm. theoretically, this is. You know, after the first few, but but pre tales, pre pre return, all that kind of thing. But but I didn't even really think of it that way. I mean, you know, you talk about this 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 question does come up. This question of Guybrush at different stages, different ages, different stages of maturity, um, and that's something that I that I do address and I do try to think about. Um, but I try to think about it m on a much more subtle level. It's something that you pick your moments for rather than it affecting the overall. Because the overall thing is people expect Guybrush, right? And that's when he's at his best and that's when he's at his funniest. Um, so it's more a matter of, for me, of finding those moments where Guybrush is going to take a moment to think about something now that three games ago maybe he wouldn't have stopped to think about you know there there is a little bit of maturity there um but for sea of thieves specifically at least the way i kind of think of it and it's almost i think it's almost kind of framed this way is that it almost it almost exists out of time you know it's almost like its own little it's almost like its own little dreamy capsule within the universe that that i don't even necessarily think of as like some canonical on a timeline thing. And I think it's better to think of it that way because it is so different, right? I mean, it's it's a little, 
I, I think of it. Um, I think of it less as a Monkey Island game and more as a Monkey Island cameo, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a very, a very involved, detailed one. But, um, but it's, uh, but it's a guest. It's a guest appearance on another show. You know what I mean? It's not. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a different thing. And that's kind of, that's kind of how I thought about it, at least. Um, and, and to that end, um, you know, I feel like it exists. I feel like it works best if it exists as its own little, as its own little parallel universe, maybe is the best way to think about it. At least that's how I thought about it. Well, thanks, Dom. You've answered a lot of great questions here. It's giving it great spending some time with it. Do you got time for one more? I got time. I, mean, I got nowhere to be. Okay, well, let me throw this one at I you. Mean, I'm good. I enjoy this. So have you put more thought into making your own adventure game? Oh, God, no. No, 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 no. Oh, same thing. Same thing with like same thing with the with the with the dining reviews and the restaurants. It's like no, no, no. I'm smart enough not to get into that business. Uh, uh-uh. uh. I've done the same thing in both industries, in both in both video games and in the restaurant industry. I've managed to find a way to carve out a little place for myself, kind of hanging on the borders where I still have a life and I don't have to deal with all of the myriad difficulties and stresses, and I can be a part of it without having to let it eat me alive. So, I mean, I know, I know enough dev stories to know um, that, you know, there, there definitely is, I think a, there are parallels between chefs and game developers in that it's the sort of thing that you, you do, if you can't, you just can't imagine yourself doing anything else. Right. I mean, there are so many other ways to make a living that are a billion times easier and less stressful and, 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 and will not wear on, on you. Um, And, uh, but, but, but you do it because it's something that you just love so much that you can't imagine doing anything else, you know? And, and I, in some ways, you know, as someone who's sort of on the borders of that world in both places, um, I, am in this constant state of awe and respect um, that also then in me translates into self-loathing because, you know, I didn't have the guts to go to the back door of the kitchen and say, throw me in the dish pit. I'm going to learn. And, you know, to, to lose all my nights and my holidays and, you know, make all my relationships difficult and make it almost impossible to have a family, you know, and, and same thing, you know, with game dev, I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, get in the trenches and crunch and spend all night coding and or doing what you know. I mean, I, I they, these are all, um, you know, I, 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 I recognize that I did not make the sacrifices that the people who I work with did, and that makes me simultaneously uh, a little ashamed, um, but but more than that, it makes me appreciate them. And that I know they do things that I um, did not make the steps to do. Um, so, so whenever anyone gets happy about any work that I do, I always kind of feel like, look, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm the one that gets to kind of swoop in at the last moment, have a bunch of fun, um, you know, be a public face, you know, get to bask in, you know, positive reviews and adulation. And then I get to move on, you know, I'm not the one who sat there for years, you know, just chipping away at this block of marble to make the thing happen Mm -hmm. so so i feel (laughs) in all cases i feel unworthy um to be uh you know mentioned along with these folks and and honestly just just tickled and thrilled that they are willing to accept me as one of themselves um i'm not sure i deserve it but i deeply deeply appreciate it humble down (laughs) it's <laughs> true I could, I could imagine somebody having a lot more of an ego you know being in this role and well i you know it's let's just, see them make it without me <laughs> no i you know i <laughs> no i'm serious though i mean it's, it's I, 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 you know this is this is part of what attracted me to voiceover in the first place is it's fun easy work you know it's funny i mean if you can do it I want to say easy. I don't mean like easy i mean it, it's a it's a it's a difficult thing to do you've got to have a talent for it obviously but um but uh, but in terms of, you know, I'm not freaking digging trenches, you know, I'm not putting in horrible long hours. You know, it's a it's a it's a it's a great business. It's a great business. And and I am 
fortunate that I've been able to do what I have with it. I'm, I'm, you know, I certainly would love to do more and I, I wish I'd done more. I, I, I hope that in the future I will be able to continue to do some more. I, I, I'm, you know, I kind of want to make that happen. We'll see. I, the life is busy. We'll see. But um, oh, you've done some Star uh, Wars stuff too. We haven't even touched on that. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that was all just that Metal was all Gear just solid and that was all. Yeah, that yeah. Well, that was funny too. <clears throat> okay, so the Star Wars stuff was all just peripheral uh, to Monkey Island because you know after I did Monkey Island, then every time there's a Lucas Arts is doing a Star Wars game, Daryl Farrell's coming into Los Angeles and he's got you know all these robots and Tie Fighter pilots and you know random Jedi to have voices for. And, uh, and, you know, you just, you just need warm bodies and it's like, Hey, Dominic, you want to do some, want to do some lines? Yeah, I'll do some lines, you know, come in, get thrown around, you know, lots of grunts and lightsabers and blaster shots and, you know, kind of fun that stuff like, like that. Fun to me. <laughs> yeah. Cantina aliens. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Cantina aliens too. That's, that was always fun too. There's this one time, uh, he, uh, we, I got come in for a session. He's like, Hey, I need some, uh, I don't remember which game it was one of the star Wars games. It's like, I need a bunch of cantina alien voices. He's like the guys in, uh, in the effects department gave me a reference tape. He's like, he says, you want to take this home and, and uh, give it a listen and see if you can do some of these for me tomorrow. I was like, yeah, sure thing. And I take the cassette tape home and on my way home, I pop it into the player in the car and I'm listening to it. It's like, and I go back the next morning, I'm like, look, Dara, I'm like I, these, like 90% of these, I think were not even made by animals, much less human animals. Um, it's like, I, you, <laughs> I will, how about, maybe, maybe it's best if I just do some, creepy weird alien noises that i'm going to imagine rather than trying to match these he's like okay fine all right let me just do that um but yeah no that was fun yeah i just got to do you know just had to pop in every few months and, and do a bunch of goofy little lines like that and then the metal gear solid thing was that was a uh, it was just a fun session it was just the one session that i did and it was uh you know it was a real it was a it was a real testosterone session because it was all the soldiers and stuff so they they packed six or seven of us six or seven guys you know all get in the studio line of microphones and uh and it's like all right you know now you're you're you know now you're attacking this whatever and all the grunts and the yells and come on around go, 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 go. yeah all that kind of stuff yeah so it was a very uh it was a very high energy very uh very testosterone laden section and i think if i recall correctly i think kojima was there i think he was like hiding out in the back row on a laptop just kind of quietly tapping away while we're doing our thing and um and also there were a couple of there were a couple of phil lamar was on that session too i got to work with phil lamar one day he was i mean one of one of seven or eight people uh you know yelling his soldiers but uh, but that was cool because he was uh i can't remember the name of the character now but he was a character in that game as well had a larger role so but i was one of the ones they brought i, I read for raiden on that didn't get it um but they brought me in to 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 do a bunch of the random lines that they needed so that was cool. It was it was a fun time. Makes me wonder if there's other characters that you wanted to do. Oh, so many. I'll tell you the one that's going to kill me forever. I wanted I I, I read for uh, uh for for Firewatch, and I wanted that one so badly. And I didn't I didn't deserve it. It was it wasn't a good audition. And I knew it. I knew it when I sent it off too. It's like I just didn't I didn't get it right. And I knew it when I sent it off. But you know sometimes that happens. Sometimes you send off an audition and you're you just know you nailed it. And sometimes you you're like I just it didn't. I didn't get it right. Um, so I knew I wasn't getting it, but God, I wish I got that one. Cause I love that game so much. Not, not right. But, about it. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that? What was not right about it? No, I mean, just, I, I don't even know that it's something I could describe just that, just you know, I, I feel like as, I mean, I feel like as an actor, you know, when you nail it, you know, when you get it just right and it flows and it feels, this is very nebulous. This is, this is not, it's not the sort of thing where I could go in and say, well, you know, the tone of this and I did this and I, I couldn't diagram it for you. You know, there is, there is, you can, you can think about those elements to some point and then you reach a point where past that it's just feel and it either feels right or it doesn't feel right. And you know, when it feels right and you know, when it doesn't, and that's at least for me, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but, um, but yeah, no, that was just players. one where where I where I knew I read it and I wanted it so badly and I and I felt like okay, I it just I just I just didn't quite get it. I didn't quite get it. Um and and uh so you know so I you know I I I I was not the least bit surprised that I didn't get a shot at that one. Um and 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 I can't be mad because the guy who they ended up casting was just phenomenal. He was so perfect. It's like oh he was great. So you know I um but uh but man I wanted that one, I wanted that one so badly. Because that's such a that again, you talk about you talk about 
storytellers, you know, uh, 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 Jake Rodkin and Sean Vanneman, you know, when they, you know, they're those, those dudes are just storytellers, man, you know, whatever medium, whatever medium they had chosen, they could have chosen any medium. And I'm sure they'd be doing just tremendous work um, because they're just, they're just natural storytellers. And I think what they, what they do is so wonderful. So I wish, I, I wish just because I wish I'd been able to be a part of that one. I loved it so much. I had a chance to be a part of it. But what are you gonna do? How it goes? Grudge or you know bitterness or anything? What's that? It's good that you don't have like a grudge or a bitterness, you know. Oh no, not. I mean, I no, yeah. no, not 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 a grudge. I, Certainly I, a grudge. No. no, I mean, look, I there, here's the you know the thing about there are it was it was the case even before voice acting became you know so much more popular with so many people out there. You know, I mean, I have not had a chance to sit in and listen to voice audition tapes, but I have to believe for any of these roles, I can't imagine that the voice directors aren't just, you know, having hordes of great reads. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it's a question of like, I don't think it's a question of who's the best. It's a question of which flavor do you decide you want to go with? You know what I mean? I mean, you can absolutely, and I've known this forever, you know, I, and maybe part of this is just because part of this is just because I, I started out so young, you know, acting, I was so young. So it's just ingrained that look, you can go in there and you can rock it up and down and inside out and do everything absolutely perfectly and not get the part because, you know, it, it, because there are, there are, there could be a lot of people who, who do a great job with it. And it's, and it's not that it doesn't mean you didn't do a great audition. It just means that, you know, they decided they wanted to go another way with it, you know, and, 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 you know, if I'm going to keep pushing these, uh, these tortured analogies, you know, with the food world, it's like, it's the same thing I keep telling people. I get so frustrated about how so much of the focus in the food world is on the best. People are obsessed with the best. What's the best hamburger? What's the best, this, the best sushi in town. It's like, why does it always have to be this cage match? to decide who is the most awesome of all, you know, like, why can't we look around town and like, I, you know, I can name like 10 spots that are all do this same thing and they all do a great job with it. And it's all, it's a little bit different at every place and they have different yeah. strengths and their own unique little spins and, and something about it. That's a little different than everybody else's then. And, 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 and how those places all come together to make a great scene. And that to me is far more interesting than like, you know, who's number one. And uh, so, so, I mean, I, I think in, in, in both cases, you know, maybe that's just, it's applying the same thing to, 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 to voice audition. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't see that not getting a part. I don't see that as a rebuke of not being the best. I see that as look, for all I know, I made it, I put a tremendous audition out there, but you know what? There are probably a lot of tremendous auditions out there and you know, you got a big plate to choose from and they get to pick somebody and they didn't pick me this time. All right. That's all right. Maybe next time. That's a very healthy <laughs> way to look at I it. think yeah I mean you have to I should drive yourself nuts I was thinking like, to. to return to the restaurant metaphor you know we all have like our favorite place but that doesn't mean you want to go there every time yeah no exactly exactly there are there are I I think you know I I I I think it's there's there are there's so much focus in so many in so many realms not just food not just not just you know, voice acting or video games, whatever. There's so much focus. People are obsessed with the best. People are obsessed with this cage mass act aspect. This, this, you know, trying to a, a singular, a singular perfect thing. You know, a singular. What's the best way to do it? And I think this. I think it's so destructive to artistry. You know, it is so destructive. And I and I think it manifests in ways like, um, you know, you you get into these debates about. Uh, 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 about, you know, when there's fan backlash against artistic choices in a video game, you know, and of course we could, if you want to bring it to Monkey Allen, you can talk about, you know, the, 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 the Rex Crawls art style, you know, and whether that was something that worked for you or didn't. Right. Um, but, but there are, you know, 80 bajillion examples out there of where people have, it's stuck in their head that there is a correct way to do this. There is a way to do this that is the way, that is the correct way, that is the proper way, and that is how it should be done. And that it's like, it's like, why not just tell all of the artists in your lives that they have no agency and are not allowed to express any creativity and must give you exactly what the focus tested thing is? It's like, it's like that is that is the death of artistry in, in all scenarios. And, and I think it really, I, you know, I don't know, 
you know, I don't know how you, this is one of those things where you're always pushing, pushing the boulder up the hill. And it's like, I don't know how to get uh, people out of that mindset, but, um, but I feel like it's just more and more prevalent. This, you know, everyone wants a top 10 list. Everyone wants, uh, everyone wants to, to be the best. You know, I, I, I see the way it shapes food media, you know, it, it changes what, what media publications write about because what people search for is best. They use that word best. You know, when you go to a city, they say, I want, I'm going to New Orleans. I want the best gumbo. I'm going to Phoenix. I want the best tacos. And that's all people search for. And because that's all people search for, that's what all the publications end up writing. And it ends up becoming this, this, this feedback loop of, 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 you know, who cares about, you know, 98% of the places in town. All we care about is like, tell me the best place for this and the best place for that and anything else. I'm not interested. And it's this awful feedback loop. And I think it's, it's, I think it's really destructive to good work. That was profound. I don't know how. We... Sorry. Did I just betray I that I've maybe spent a little bit of time it. thinking about this? <laughs> that is the problem, right? It's a I problem. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't that like the best problem. I don't like to oversimplify things either, problem. but it's a problem. <laughs> We have the so. best analysis ever done. Uh, let's see if we can wrap it there up. There are many good analyses out there. <laughs> no. Man. You know, no, there's just... only the best. We we nailed it forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just you know, even Ron, I was just thinking about with his. Uh, you know, he's got. The, have you read that? Uh, Why adventure games suck. I oh, say, oh, I know. No, I, I've heard about this. No, I, I have just not. Think about that because I mean, kind of what he did was like why are we you know we, why do we keep doing it this way you know we, we could be you know totally changing up all these you know established tropes of this this genre and yep. people would like it a lot better and i mean good for him you know no well, i mean it's true and if nothing take else, a just stand mean, against this just stuff do something as, different just as like, there's there is there is there is value in diversity it's like everything doesn't have to be the yeah. same and i and i and 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 i actually i don't i have not spoken with ron about this i i don't know whether or not we would agree i have a tendency i i would tend to think we'd probably come down the same way on this but like all right that analogy uh, terrible analogy time again i hate the notion i hate the notion that every industry is like a constant evolution towards a perfect thing, right? I hate that whole idea, you know, uh, and, and, and this in the food world, this always would manifest with me um, in the early day. I think he's actually kind of backed off it a little bit, but uh, uh, Kenji Lopez alt, you know, who, who wrote uh, uh, for serious eats and, you know, is, is a tremendously uh, uh, talented and, 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 and beloved food writer, you know, particularly in cooking and his earlier work, was so, you know, the thing that was so great about him is that he would always think about, well, what's a better way to do this? We do this thing because this is how it's been done in kitchens forever, right? And why don't, but why do we have to do it that way? Maybe this way is better. That part of it was great, right? But then the second half of what he would do is then he would take that, okay, now we've tried this new way. This way is better. This is the way. And everything was like trying to narrow it down to figuring out, the best way to make this dish, the singular best way to make this dish. And, and I, I don't think that's any better than the best way that, uh, you know, that, that ever, that was the, 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 the common knowledge best way to do it before, you know, it's like, can, can, it's okay to do things differently. It's okay to have different takes, you know, every, you know, we don't, and not everyone has to be done exactly the same way. Um, so, so I, 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 and I think, you know, that's in, you know, in the adventure games place too, you know, it's like, hell yeah, do new things. Absolutely. Please do new things, try new things, see what works and see, doesn't see what doesn't. Um, but, but don't, you know, don't start, don't, don't jump out of one box just to jump into a new box. You know, yeah. I, you know, it, you know, just, just keep, keep playing with things. And coming back to our favorite restaurant analogy. I mean, you can like Sierra, you can like King's Quest, you can like Gabriel Knight, you can like yes. Monkey Island, you can you like... You can love uh, all of the above. Or not, that's fine too, you know, but but it's, but it's you don't have to, you don't have to choose a team if you don't want to. <laughs> you can, you know, you can, you can appreciate them all. I mean, in terms of my, in terms of my personal habits too, I mean, that tends to be how I game. You know, I'm not personally not much of a genre gamer. Um, you know, I really tend to, I'm someone who tends to pick and choose. 
You know, I tend to, I, I find that my preferences tend to the quirkier, more unusual examples within any given genre. That's usually what appeals to me is someone who's doing something a little differently within whatever their genre is. I, you know, I find that that's, that's usually what I find interesting, but then that's what I find interesting. You know, not everybody does. What do you, so what are you playing these days? You mentioned Firewatch. That's been up. Is oh, well, that, yeah, that was quite projects cool. that are out there that yeah. really, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, right. I'm, I tend to, I'm very much like I'm focused. I pick a game and I play it. And then like the next one, I can't, I don't have the, I deal with enough of this in my day-to-day -day life that I can't jump around from game to game. I got to have one. I'm in the middle of cyberpunk right now. I finally, yeah. I wanted to wait for it all. And I knew Phantom Liberty was coming. So, it's, and that was when I really wanted to play. Cause that's just that whole, you know, like, like Blade Runner is near and dear to my heart. So like just that whole stylistic milieu is uh, that's, I, I love that stuff. So it's a good adventure so, game. You played, have you played those? I assume you have. What's that? I'm sorry. For the Blade Runner game and, uh, yeah yeah a bunch of those cyberpunk adventure games yeah. is is blade runner are they what's are they the, what's the, are they i'm thinking of uh steel yeah. beneath the still sky i think oh i know the name of it yeah i don't i don't i didn't oh, i didn't play the revolution that. it's been a while since i've explored that yeah <laughs> and anyway you're cyberpunk <laughs> uh, well yes yeah, so I, I just like that whole you know futury type of thing so so i so that was one that i was totally gonna play um, so I, I waited, you know, given, given the early response, like, eh, 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 I'll wait a little while. <laughs> so <laughs> once things seemed to settle down, I jumped in. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm loving it. So, and it's I certainly like pretty, a pretty good era for adventure games. There seem to be some really good ones. <clears throat> there is, yeah. There's a lot, a lot of, of good, good narratives that. out there. And it is a lot of it is coming from these smaller studios, you know, really uh, creative stuff. I'll tell you the one, the one, the fellow whose stuff I am truly embarrassed to have not played yet. And that's, that's like on my, on my on deck in my on deck circle is I've never played any of Dave Gilbert's games and that's driving me nuts. Um, which is, and I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed to admit it. I'm sorry, Dave. Um, but, uh, but, but it's, uh, but that's like, that's like in my on deck circle is I got to play some of his stuff. Um, cause, and it, it really was only just brought on my radar, um, recently, you know, when, uh, uh, last year at PAX, people were talking about Dave Gilbert. Cause again, like I said, I'm not even really a genre gamer. So that was, it was just kind of off my radar and, um, but I gotta, I gotta play that. I'm really looking forward to it. I yeah. so just like, which one? Where do I go in first? When did I? End? I interviewed him not too long ago. He's a really. I got. I get to. He's. He's. A, he's 2013. A, he's, so I guess it is. Yeah, we talked about. He's. A, he's. A, he's. A, he seems like a really cool guy. <laughs> oh, definitely. There's a fellow I'd love to work with. I can't. Yeah, remember. Maybe you should. Uh... He's a non-union shop. He's very small. He's a non-union shop. Um, but uh, but man, I'd love. I'd love to. I'd love to work with him. But I'll drop him. We'll see. Thing. Someday. Someday. <laughs> There you go, get bigger, uh, Dave. Get bigger, Dave, so you can, so you can, so you can. <laughs> Wait go till you hear my audition. <laughs> Be good for all of us, especially him. That's a fantastic, fantastic series. What is he up to now? Well, he's got at least a couple dozen. Yeah. Now he's just been churning them out, man. Yeah, and plus all that great work as a publisher too, working with other studios. And yeah. Well, wasn't because uh, uh, another one that's on my short, it's my short list. It's not that short um Hobbs Barrow was the excavation of Hobbs Barrow that's been getting a lot of a lot of buzz people say it's just wonderful I need to play that um and that's one that I if I recall if I'm correct he did not make that one but he published that one for some other some other indie developers I think maybe I could be wrong I really should not be speaking about this cloak so and dagger game here so I'm 100 talking out of places I should not talk out hey, of a folk horror point and click adventure game yeah, I've heard great things about England that. during the Victorian era. Uh, uh, I've heard very good things. I need to add this to my queue. Right? This is the problem, <laughs> isn't it? Video games and restaurants, the list never gets shorter. It only gets longer. There's not enough time. Most Too many restaurants. Too many games. We probably uh, <laughs> <laughs> wrap it up. Fair enough. Fair God, enough. Great. This is, this is a fantastic chat. Thank you so much. No, it's no problem at all. Happy to. And this one, now I can put a face to the name. Right? <laughs> Where are you located, by the way? Just out of curiosity. Hmm? Where are you located? Just out of curiosity. I'm in Minnesota. Saint You're in Minnesota. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I grew up in Louisiana, though. Oh, I'm going next week. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, Where are you headed? Louisiana's it's a big place. I'm going to New Orleans, so, you know. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, there's a few restaurants there. 
I, I hear there's a couple. I hear there's a couple. I want to know which one's the best. I don't know. Ah. <laughs> you know, Beignet place is really good. Oh, right. I think of the name of it. And Cafe du Monde. Yes, I know. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Everybody yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now I'm sure we'll. I'm sure we'll. Have a lot. A lot of places will. Well, I know. I. I actually started making reservations last night. I've been soliciting recommendations from people for the past week and a half. So now I'm sorting through all of them and getting stuff on the books. Yeah, I was so. there. I went visiting not too long ago. I'm always. It's kind of hard to get crawfish here. You know the go yeah. Crawfish boil, so I'm always gonna <laughs> go for that option. <laughs> we have local crawfish here in Arizona. How weird is that? And there's not a lot of them. Yeah, there's apparently we have uh, there's some there's a couple of rivers in northern Arizona where there's a, they, and they do they do a big crawfish festival in northern Arizona oh, every I mean, year. Yeah, they save all their catch for a good long while. And they have a big festival. I know I've been meaning to get there. I haven't gotten up there for it, but uh, but yeah, no. When I learned that, it was I I did. Uh, it's hard to beat a good crawfish boil. Yeah. I, I did this series of videos a while back for the newspaper um, where it was because there's sort of this perception outside, particularly outside of Arizona, but even to some extent within Arizona, they're like, oh, we're in a desert. Nothing grows here, you know, blah, 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 which is so it's like the stupidest thing ever. It has no basis in reality. Um, so so I did this series where the whole thing was was getting chefs to play with local ingredients that nobody would have guessed were things we had or could get here or whatever. And one of them was crawfish. I wanted someone to do crawfish. And I was like, really local Arizona crawfish? Like, yes, local Arizona crawfish. Um, but unfortunately when we had to do the videos, they weren't quite in season. It was like, ah, it would have been so good. So close. Um, but, uh, but no, that was, uh, that was, that was a bit of fun. So, so now I'm looking forward to that. I got to find some, uh, I'm super interested in Viet Cajun. Like I'm so, I got to find places for that. It's easy to get recommendations for just like good Creole restaurants or Cajun restaurants or, you know, the typical, uh, you know, New Orleans stuff. But, um, but I really want to try to, I'm dying to get to some of that, you know, that intersection of the local Cajun Creole and the Vietnamese community. And, you know, where the whole, you know, how that whole Viet Cajun crab boil thing has just sort of caught fire and spreading across the country, you know, from a, from a, from a culinary history standpoint, that's, that's fascinating to me and the whole cross pollination of cultures. And I just have to believe that there is some really, really fascinating stuff being done in that arena that is probably uh, kind of quiet, quietly happening in the background and hasn't, hasn't broken out. I mean, you know, like the crab boil thing has broken out. The Viet Cajun crab boil has, but I feel like there's got to be more going on. You know, I'm sure there's going to be some tremendously interesting, you know, I like po' boy, bon me, come on. There's got to be some interesting stuff going on here. You know what I mean? So, so we'll see. I want to try to find some of that. You like real spicy foods? And hot I like everything. I like everything. I, I, like just, it. I mean, seriously, so just make it good. I don't care. Any kind. Make it good. Yeah, I can handle spicy, but it doesn't have to be spicy. This is always such a hard thing. I don't want to go like, much much hotter than Tabasco. It's just too much. So the funny thing is, is, like you know, you go to restaurants where where Thai restaurant is a perfect example because you know there's always there's always a thing about Thai restaurants and how you know they they when they go hot, holy crap, they go hot. I mean, their 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 tens will destroy mortals, right? Um, but then also that doesn't mean everything should be hot, you know? No. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, they, they, they eat food that isn't, you know, going to destroy your face. Um, so, and, and, and the tight restaurants always, they, and because and it's hard because, you know, people want to have stuff and they want to adjust the heat to their preference. And it's like, and it's so hard to get across these places. I go and it's like, make it, make it how you like it. That's what I always tell them. Like, first of all, there's nothing you can serve me that I can't eat. I mean, I've I've never gone into a restaurant and been a, been unable to eat something because it was too spicy. That's never happened. All right. Never, you so, must have never ordered the scorched Alaska. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> fair. Right. Maybe, maybe there's always something, right? There's always an exception to the rule. Um, but um, but that's never been an issue. So within that, it's like if it if you think it should be hot, make it hot. If you think it should be mild, make it mild. I hate I hate the whole choose your heat thing. I hate that. Make it the way it's good. You know. I mean, I get it. I understand from a practical standpoint, I get it, but, but it's so, but it's so frustrating to me. So I always tell people in restaurants like that, and I, it's so hard to get it across. I'm like, make it the way you like it. If you were making it for yourself back there, make it that way. That's how I want to try it always. 
Sounds good. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we were done and then I got off on food again. Sorry. Good to, yeah. But yeah, I'm going to, uh, we'll stop it here. Okay. All right. Good, uh, <laughs> thanks again for your time. That's been awesome. Oh no, it's no problem at all. Very good to meet you. Thank you, sir. I'll have you back on next time. There's a monkey Island. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll be here. God willing. I'll be here and, uh, and happy about it rather than going, Oh my God, they, recast me and replaced me with, uh, oh, no. with Seth Rogen in Monkey Island, the animated series. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was wondering about how voice actors feel about that sort of thing when you when it's a game, you know, or something animated and they bring in a, a well-known sort of screen actor, face actor, you know, when they could have they had, they had a perfectly uh, good selection of professional voice actors to choose from. You know, why bring in this person that's, that's not even their line? I, you know, the, the, you want you want to get into something that I am a little bitter about, and I try I try really hard not to be, um, but but like one of the main things that brought me out to LA was I really wanted to do animated film. I had met with a Disney animation casting director in Chicago, and she was like, "Dude, you got to come out to LA." And this was at a time when, if you were not a major name celebrity, you had a chance of having a good role in a Disney animated film. It was sort of the earlier years of the Renaissance, you know, um, you know, like little mermaid and Aladdin and whatever, you know, they would cast a celebrity here and there or whatever, but, 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 you know, most of the names were just talented actors. Um, and, uh, and of course I moved out to Los Angeles right around the time, you know, there was Aladdin and then there was Lion King and then it was all over. <laughs> and then it was like, Oh, I'm sorry. You know, 200 million people won't recognize your name. No, we're not interested. So, yeah. yeah so that was, I, I came out exactly, you know, I came out at just the right time for interactive, but I was a few years too late for, uh, for, for film at the time, which is what I really wanted to do. It was what I came out for, but it seems to have worked out. Okay. So yeah, I feel it's like easy, that, it's easier to not be bitter about it. Like I don't need some, you know, screen celebrity, some big stuff. I mean, they've already, it's, that's a, I know it's hard enough to, you know, it's a different. And they're never, and they're, and they're them, really, I, don't, I, mean, but I won't say yeah, never. There are some who are very good, but they're rarely as good because they're yeah. completely different disciplines. They are completely different disciplines. You know, on Some camera, totally focused actors. on voice. Yes, <laughs> they're they're different skill sets. They're different disciplines, and and there are there are actors who absolutely do both wonderfully. But just because you're good at one is does not mean you're going to be good at the other. Um, and and the thing that's so frustrating is it's one of those situations where. I can't be too angry because I get it. I get it. I understand. At the end of the day, you got to sell tickets. And at the end of the day, people see the name on the poster and that sells tickets. So even though I may know deep in my heart that this is detrimental to creating the best work, I don't know how mad I can be because I can't say they're making the wrong decision. You know what I mean? I don't know that I can say that, you know, for, for what for what they need to do. Yeah, maybe the best thing is to pay for some big name and uh, Seth Rogen. back seats because of it. So I can't, I can't even get mad about that. It makes me sad from an artistic standpoint, but I'll get mad for you. No, I'll appreciate it. <laughs> All right, I'm really going this time. I'm going. I'm hanging up now because otherwise we're going to do right. this for. I'm never going to go. And I do actually need to do some shit today. Uh, right. Good to see you, sir. Be well. Thanks. Give me a shout anytime. All right. I'll send you a note when we when I post this. Yeah, please, and then I'll, I'll share it and stuff too. Let me know. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode i hope you guys enjoyed that it's a lot of fun talking with dom uh thanks by the way to matt bradley shergy uh for setting that up for me good guy matt uh, good guy dom <laughs> this is you know, i think he's the first time i've ever uh, had a voice actor on the show before that was it was quite fun uh hearing the you know, you hear the voice so much, right? It's kind of, but seeing the face, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of a, a, a kind of a trip for me. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you to Dom for agreeing to do that. As always, I want to thank you. Yes, you, you. Uh, thank you very, very, very much for supporting the show, keeping it on the air, keeping these interviews coming. I wouldn't do it without you. You know, it's really important that uh, to me that you're willing to step up and support the program. I mean, I'm glad you watched the videos, but uh, if you want to do a little more to support the show, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page, and you can sign up in a few minutes. It's so easy to do, and you're, you're uh, 
enjoyment of the show will rise exponentially uh, the second you click submit on that Patreon form. It's, it's really just magical uh, how that works. So uh, thanks to all who have done that. We've come Ratrons and we're chatting on Discord. It's uh, a real hoot, so don't miss out. I'll go to that link in the show notes right or rat <laughs> now. Do it right now, yeah. All right, what about the news from the Matt Cave? Oh, we've got some news. Uh, first up, some news concerning yours truly. Uh, I was on the Retro RPG Roundtable. Uh, Mark of Knox Arcast was, was gracious enough to invite me on to, uh, to hang out with the real <laughs> indie RPG devs. <laughs> I'm a poser. <laughs> uh, but we had a good chat. It was good meeting these. Uh, you know, I've met some of these already. I actually had them on the show. I need to get the other ones on the show as well. They're all just fantastic. Uh, Call of Serig Ser Serignar, Call of Serignar, The Dark Unknown, World of Enterra, Realms of Antiquity, of course, Nox Archaea. So, I mean, if you are at all, and I mean at all, interested in indie RPG uh, development, you just cannot miss this. Not only this episode, but all the work these guys are doing. Uh, really fantastic. Uh, round table. Uh, plus, <laughs> you can see me smoking my pipe. <laughs> all right, and then next up, we got Sobchak wrote in about uh, well, he wrote about a write-up about the game The Last Express by Jordan Meshner. Is it Meshner? Meshner? Uh, one of those. Uh, the dig Digital Antiquarian, who, by the way, also should have on the show. Uh, so if you're watching Digital Antiquarian, <laughs> you might be next. <laughs> anyway, it's a great write-up. They talk in here about how the uh, developers, designers wanted to do something that would be considered a work of art. Uh, literature, basically, not just another adventure game. And, you know, uh, did they succeed? Uh, I don't know. You tell me if you played The Last Express, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on it. Uh, I have to admit, I've played around a little bit with it. Uh, you know, like most people, I'm kind of amazed by the art style, the graphic direction on it. But I have to admit, I've yet to complete it. So I should go back and, and have a go. Isn't it like, uh, lit or not linear? What's the word? It's like on a clock. It's a time game, if I recall correctly. Yeah, so anyway, about his train. <laughs> oh, got a lot of new. Oh, Matt Workula. Hey, how you doing, Matt? Uh, he wrote in about a little game called Islands of the Caliph. It's Caliph or Caliph? <laughs> I am terrible with pronunciations. You know, <laughs> what? <a laughs> you think an English professor would know more how to pronounce things? But anyway, Islands of the Caliph. Caliph. It's Caliphate. Right? It's a Caliph. Anyway. Uh, this is a, looks like a good old-fashioned CRPG dungeon crawl, but with a nice twist. Let's see, divined by solo developer Schmidt Workshops, uh, Islands of the Caliph uh, imagines an ancient seafaring civilization based on Middle Eastern folklore and Islamic spiritual traditions. I don't think I've seen that one before, so I'm really uh, intrigued by this. And it's only $8 and some I think eight dollars and a quarter on Steam. Uh, so if you're a little bored with the traditional stuff, you might want to check this out. But it looks really cool, even uh, you know without the twist. It looks like a neat game. Uh, let's see. Maybe I should have him on too. That'd be fun. I bet we could have a real interesting conversation. Okay, Miko Selva uh, writes in about a, yet another great. I mean, are we in a golden age or what, folks? I mean, wow. Uh, Mystic Land, search for Map Haldo or Mafaldo. An upcoming Wizardry 7 inspired blobber, 30 years in the making. You had me at Wizardry 7. <laughs> Fight glorious battles and go into the heart of evil itself. Go into the heart of evil itself. Uh, okay, I guess that sounds like fun. <laughs> Find riches beyond your wildest dreams. <laughs> You know, maybe these developers will find riches beyond your wildest dreams. I mean, holy cow, we've, we've promoted your stuff, Miko and I, and Matt Chet. Now there's be thousands of people rush out to buy Mystic Land, Search for Mafaldo. Hey, you got to check this trailer out. I mean, doesn't that look like, how can you look at this video and not want to play it? I mean, give me a break. And then last but not least, Punny. Yes, Punny, 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 Punny. A new Commandos game. Commandos Origins, 
Alarm! You have been selected for a mission which will shape the fate of the entire world. Witness the very beginning of the legendary elite World War II forces and Commando's origins. The long-awaited sequel to the Commando series brings you right back to the foundation of the real-time tactics genre. Coming soon to Steam. <laughs> yes, all these friends I have, and you know, I wouldn't know any of this stuff if I didn't have that Discord channel. So. I don't always. I don't mention all of them, by the way. So, uh, the only way to get the full scoop, of course, is to go to that Discord channel. The only way to do that is if you are a ratrop. All right, let's wrap it up then with a quotation. Now, here's the quote. Yeah, I hope you know where this is from. It's actually got a couple parts to it. First part: You fight like a dairy farmer. Second part: How appropriate. You fight like a cow. <laughs> Yes, you probably know what that is, sword fighting insult. Now, what you might not have known, though, I didn't know this until I was, uh, I was looking for quotes from the game on WikiQuote, and this one was apparently written by Orson Scott Card. You know, he's the guy that did Ender's Game, one of my favorite science fiction novels. Uh, yeah, I wonder if he, he must have written some stuff since then. I don't know. <laughs> I'd be curious to know. Uh, anyway, I think that will do it for this week. Hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you guys next week. Is, you know, it's not just a keel and a hole and a deck and sails, that's what a ship needs, but what a ship is, what the Black Pearl really is, is freedom.